So it's my pleasure this morning to welcome our applicants for general surgery residency who are online somewhere. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Um, we're going to have a lot to tell you about the program and why you would want to come here for your training. Uh, but first, we have special grand rounds with Dr. Russell Farmer, who is a an Aggie from Texas A&M. Did I hear somebody cheer that on? One of the many Texans who come here and, and loved it, stayed here. I uh, went to UT Houston for medical school and then residency right here at the University of Louisville, as well as fellowship in uh, colorectal surgery. Uh, picked up a master's degree along the way, has uh, been one of our very best and uh, highest rated educators in the Department of Surgery for many, many years. We'll see why in a minute. Uh, among his very busy clinical uh, duties, his research activities, and his educational commitment, he's now uh, taken a major focus in the dean's office as the senior associate dean for undergraduate medical education. So all you medical students, if you have any complaints, uh, talk to Dr. Farmer after his presentation. Or if you want to tell him what a great job he's doing, you can do that too. Uh, Dr. Farmer has uh, really taken leadership roles uh, in education and patient care uh, and, and has been uh, doing everything in the Department of Surgery for a long, long time, but now with a, a major focus in education. Uh, we appreciate all that you do, Dr. Farmer, and especially uh, giving grand rounds this morning. Thank you. All right. Good morning. Thank you. Um, so we're going to talk about UC, which is, uh, it's kind of an interesting thing in the world of colon and rectal surgery in that, uh, and the reason I titled this talk as I did is that we're operating on it less and less, but that doesn't obviate us from uh, understanding the science. And I think you'll find this an area that's kind of interesting and maybe like applicable to everybody. And um, maybe most importantly, uh, we're going to try and get you all as many points uh, for the end of the month as we possibly can. That's the goal for today. Um, and also to keep our, our online audience uh, entertained and engaged as much as possible. Um, let's see if this slide thing is going to work, perhaps. Let's do that. Oh, I have no disclosures. Um, we're going to start off with some multiple choice questions. Um, these are some things you might see on the app site. So which of the following is not the name of a current therapeutic target for salvage therapy in ulcerative colitis? Jack kinase, IL-23, BDH, or Integrin Alpha-1, right? Everyone loves these questions that have all the little abbreviations of the genes, the proteins, and stuff like that. Anybody have an answer? Just yell it out. C, okay. What a C, that's one of my kids. He told me it's a droid from Star Wars, okay? So... Uh, which of the following is not the name of a known restorative proctocolectomy on aleal pouch technique? S pouch, W pouch, K pouch, L pouch. Anybody? It's L pouch. There we go. I said L. Hillary, of course it was Hillary, right? <laughs> All right, good. All right, if IGM could wear pants, how would it wear them? <laughs> So this is the overview of our talk for today. So we're going to talk a little bit about the history of ulcerative colitis, which is kind of fascinating. The epidemiology of the disease, uh, where it comes from, how we make a diagnosis. There's going to be a lot of uh, high value, high yield stuff for the surgery shelf and the app site there. How we manage that and how that's evolved over the past three, four, five years. Um, and we're going to talk about surgery and how we do it and then some special considerations. So first off, we'll talk about the history of UC. It's kind of a fascinating concept. Um, it was originally described at the, in the late 1700s uh, by an English physician named Matthew Bailey. Um, and he was the nephew of John Hunter, the anatomist, um, and John's uh, uh, less successful, um, but uh, nowhere, uh, somehow um, still involved uh, brother, uh, was Dr. Bailey's uh, father. Um, and he had originally described in this manuscript uh, called Morbid Anatomy of the Important Parts of the Human Body, um, what he called separation of the bowel. 
Um, and when you go back and you examine um, what this manuscript meant, it really was the first um, treatise on specifically just pathology and the description of disease. And so what that means is that he used this uh, particular manuscript as a way that he didn't talk about how to treat patients. He didn't talk about um, any sort of, you know, symptoms of diagnosis. This literally was just the description of the human body and its ill state. And the pathologist would say this is the first known description purely of pathologic significance in Western medical literature. But his contributions to the pathologic literature are largely overshadowed by people that had more important discover discoveries, people like Morgagni and, and Virchow and people like that. But this is, it's a very interesting thing that this was included in the first kind of pathologic document in Western history. A lot of the work also was done by Samuel Wilkes as a follow-up to this um, because we didn't believe that inflammatory bowel disease was a separate clinical entity for uh, up, probably up until the 20th century. Um, but this was the first known clinical description of it uh, as a woman who presented with pancolonic ulceration who ultimately died from severe bloody diarrhea. Um, and this is the first account we believe of UC as its own individual clinical uh, presentation apart from Crohn's disease. Um, but uh, the original um, description of the two was often conflated. And you'll see that that is a persistent theme throughout the talk, that it's difficult to separate these entities clinically um, unless you are very focused on trying to pick them apart. In the late 1800s, after uh, Samuel Wilkes, we had the development of ranconology and x-rays, and, and we were able to detect granulomas in people. We also had that happening at the rise of the same time as light microscopy. So that's when the concept of granulomas, and a lot of people believe that granulomas were a common linking theme between all inflammatory bowel disease, and so we didn't know about crypt abscesses at that point. Um, and it was believed at the time that because granulomas were seen in people with uh, these symptoms, that it was going to be related to things like brucella and uh, mycobacterium TB. Um, in the 1900s, we began to believe that it might be due exclusively to a, a normal GI commensal uh, infective agent, as we learned about things like enterococcus and whatnot. And then in the 50s and 60s, the concept of autoimmunity was discovered. The fact that people can be essentially allergic to their own body. And then as the 1900s progressed in the early 2000s, we learned about things like the gut microbiome and TNF-alpha and the fact that there's an interplay between those things. And so that became the kind of essentially for about 20 years, the final common pathway for medical treatment for ulcerative colitis. The history of this is also interesting and in that history runs in parallel. John F. Kennedy famously had ulcerative colitis and uh, obviously was able to manage it okay. Um, uh, and then also one of the leaders of modern Japan, Shinzo Abe, who was the prime minister there from 2012 until 2020, uh, after additionally being elected prime minister in 2006, famously had ulcerative colitis. Interestingly enough, when he was initially elected prime minister of Japan in 2006, that was not long thereafter where his ulcerative colitis became significantly symptomatic, and he actually had to remove himself from office for a time to seek medical treatment, uh, ultimately was able to uh, regain, uh, you know, more of his uh, function and then uh, return to public life again in 2008, ultimately to be reelected four years later. And the parity between these two does not end there. Uh, and the fact that they were ultimately both assassinated, as you remember, Shinzo Abe was famously ass assassinated uh, last summer um, in Japan. So uh, it's strange the way the history parallels itself. Let's talk a little about the etiology of ulcerative colitis and where it comes from. Um, this is uh, an ongoing area of debate, and uh, this is a potential area um, of discovery and uh, career-making uh, potential uh, in the field of research for our young people in the audience. If you want to be guaranteed um, the capability of publication and funding and uh, ongoing uh, academic debate for the rest of your career, uh, look into what causes ulcerative colitis because this will be uh, ongoing probably for many years to come. 
we really don't know where it comes from, but there's kind of three major different theories. One is we believe there's an alteration in the immunity of the intestine um, versus normal commensal bacteria. So the stuff that lives inside your gut every day and that drives macrophage mediated uh, autoimmune reactions. So normally the macrophages that live inside the lining of the intestine are perfectly happy uh, to sit there and not attack the bugs that live inside our guts every day. But for some reason, people with ulcerative colitis have a different reaction. Their macrophages tend to go a little bit crazy and start doing things that macrophages do against non-commensal bacteria. The second theory is that the variability of the gut flora can create dysbiosis. So what does that mean? So some people believe it's not the macrophages response to normal amounts and presence of gut commensal bacteria, right? So the first group of people say you're walking around with a relatively normal amount of bacteria in your gut and there's a problem with your macrophages that go crazy. The second group of people think that there's a variability in the amount of gut flora and the macrophages aren't at fault. It's the gut flora that's at fault, okay? And so because your gut flora is messed up, the macrophages react differently. And the third group of people believe that there is a novel antigen that is common to first world peoples that sets off this process and creates a dysbiosis in one and two somehow. And that is because we know that as modernization of countries occurs, uh, for some reason or another, the prevalence of ulcerative colitis seems to skyrocket. Now, you might make the argument that that's a huge selection bias because as those countries modernize, they're more able to diagnose ulcerative colitis, understand what's going on with their patient population, provide you know modern medical care, and et cetera. But um, that link uh, antedates uh, the modernization of a lot of different countries. And so um, uh, a lot of folks still believe that there's somehow uh, a little bit of a missing link between one and two, and they make that up between some sort of environmental response, okay? So, you know, when you look at the uh, cytokinetic activities around ulcerative colitis, which really is the target of medical therapy, the macrophage is the common link right? Um, it's the point from which um, TNF-alpha and IL-23 and IL-6 are coming in and activating all these T-cells. Gut bacteria come in, uh, anger the macrophage, and it starts doing all of its fun stuff. And each one of these potential uh, molecules has been areas of, of treatment for us um, in, in the colorectal world. Um, anytime there's a really nice published document with this really beautiful color picture and you see a question mark, right? That means someone's going to make a career out of this, right? Okay. <laughs> Many people are going to make a career out of this. So if you're a medical student looking to publish on something, go find a question mark in a picture and you'll get fun. Okay. Um, so we believe there is a genetic contribution um, as an Ashkenazi Jew myself. Um, it's well known uh, that um, it's actually a joke in the community that people in our community have a much elevated level of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, but we do know that about 10 to 20 percent of all patients with ulcerative colitis will have a family member uh, with either Crohn's or UC. Um, interestingly enough, unlike Crohn's disease, there is not a hard and fast genetic linkage. So Crohn's disease, um, patients that have inherited Crohn's disease have a link to something called the NOD2 gene, N-O-D-2, all caps, for those of you taking your app site and your board exam at the end of the month, okay? Um, but uh, there is not that strong association with ulcerative colitis. Um, monozygotic twins have it about 50%, which is just enough to say that we don't really know what's going on because we have two twins and 50%, so... Um, it is not Mendelianly inherited. So if you do pedigrees on these people, we don't see the direct Mendelian chain of inheritance. Um, you know, again, people think that industrialization results in an increased rate of UC um, because we find that people that have low fiber, high sugar diets and potential food allergies have a much higher rate of ulcerative colitis. Now, whether or not, again, that that's true or if that's selection bias, we don't know. Let's talk a little bit about the epidemiology of UC. 
So it is about uh, anywhere between 120 to 200 for 100,000. Um, and just for kind of baseline medical knowledge, if you see any of these uh, prevalence charts like this, and it's over 100 for 100,000, that's a disease that most doctors should know about, at least people familiar with the fact that it needs treatment. Anything less than 100 uh, per 100,000 is probably a lot less common, and you'll see it a couple times in, in a career. Um, there's been a real rapid rise in the developing world. Um, when we initially started uh, tracking UC uh, very, you know, kind of rigorously in the 80s, we were about five to eight patients per 100,000. And then um, that uh, there's about 50 to 60 per 100,000. But this is not the prevalence. This is the delta delta. So what that means is we're gaining this over the past couple of years. So we've gone from about half of this or a third of this in the 80s to basically an asymptotic curve at this point. Um, again, about 1% of the American population will carry a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease at some point in their lifetime. That's not inconsequential. You think about the number of people that you hear about, you know, so uh, one of the most commonly well-known and experienced diseases out there, something like breast cancer or colon cancer, stuff like that, you know, about, you know, seven, eight percent of the American population is going to experience or be touched by that disease over some point in their life. So that means a lot of people are going to carry a diagnosis of IBD. You're going to know somebody, you're going to have a family member. And so these are diseases that you need to know about. Okay. The interesting thing that's a real kind of note of importance for the surgical trainees, especially, is that, you know, as a colorectal surgeon, I primarily think of ulcerative colitis as a surgical disease, but it is not. Um, the vast majority of patients that suffer from ulcerative colitis will never come to surgery. Um, and they really have what's it's termed or explained similar to the way we would describe a lot of other autoimmune or relapsing remitting conditions. So about 60% of patients are managed medically with what they call a relapsing remitting or intermittent relapsing course of ulcerative colitis throughout their lifetime. These patients will never come to surgery. They'll never um, be seen in urgent surgical consultation because what will happen is they'll kind of move along and then they'll have a flare and they'll call their their personal physician or they'll call their gastroenterologist and they'll get taken care of and they'll move along. Um, if you look at that uh, group of patients that has UC, about three quarter of them really are without symptoms at any given time. And that's one of the things that led to such initial confusion with Crohn's disease is because similar to Crohn's, this can act in a kind of flare phenomenon where you could be going along, going along, and all of a sudden you have an issue, you treat it medically, it seems to resolve going along, going along, another problem, okay? So the average number, or sorry, the median number of flares per year with ulcerative colitis is about five to six, okay? But interestingly enough, a lot of people, these are so mild, they only seek care for about half of them. So a lot of people that have, are in this 1.3% of the population walking around with this as a diagnosis, just kind of deal with it and move on the majority of the time, or at least half the time. Trends right here at home in the bluegrass, um, it is much less prevalent than in many other states. Um, we have a real big population of people with Crohn's disease. And um, it's really interesting in that way because the rates of uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in Kentucky essentially appear to be flipped in terms of uh, how patients present and, and the incidence of this disease. That probably has to do with the fact that about a quarter of the Kentucky population are smokers. And uh, as is very famous for this disease, smoking is a suppressor for ulcerative colitis. As a matter of fact, it's such a powerful suppressor uh, that uh, there was a, a number of decades where patients with ulcerative colitis were actually prescribed cigarettes as a treatment. Um, and so uh, because we have such a large population of people that smoke, um, it's going to suppress what otherwise would be symptomatic here at home. Now, the flip side of that coin is that we're going to have a lot of people that show up with Crohn's disease, um, and the people on the right-hand side of the room have seen them all. Um, so, and they know exactly what I'm talking about. All right. So why is this a surgical zebra? Um, surgery has become less and less and less common in ulcerative colitis than it used to be. Um, and that is because there has been a significant shift in treatment and therapy. 
Um, we're doing fewer and fewer what we call restorative proctocolectomies. Um, the residents will uh, think of that in terms of what we call an, a, an ileal pouch, where we remove the entirety of the colon and attempt to make a reservoir for stool out of the small bowel and then sew that down uh, into the pelvis. Um, and the, what that has basically resulted in is a consolidation in the knowledge, the technical ability, um, and long-term patient follow-up uh, for patients with ileal pouches. And to the point that um, a number of accrediting organizations um, and people that have an interest in training folks in how to do uh, this type of surgery um, are really kind of battling with themselves um, and in and among graduates and diplomates because, uh, you know, what is the right number or, and what is the right volume of these patients to see in order to follow them appropriately? Is it, you know, if you've done it three times, is it enough? If you've done it 10 times, is it enough? If you follow patients for how long, what's the period you need to follow them for? Because once you operate on these patients, they're your patient for life. That pouch that you create um, and put down in their pelvis is something that has to be um, actively looked at. You have to see these patients back and follow up. And if you don't know how to manage these patients long term, um, and yet you perform these operations, um, you can be setting both yourself and, and, and the patient up for a world of heartache. And so um, the consolidation of this knowledge into a handful of centers has led to a number of places across the country simply abandoning this as a form of surgery uh, and surgical treatment. All right, let's get to the good stuff so that way we can get you some points, okay? You really need a combination of findings to be able to diagnose someone with ulcerative colitis, okay? This is not as simple as you have a highly sensitive troponin and ST elevation on EKG and now off we go to the cath lab, okay? Um, and I don't mean to diminish cardiology in any way. However, I do say that I, I wanna highlight the fact that this is a diagnosis that can be subtle, um, it's multivariate and you have to really have your head about you as you make, okay? Because there is no one finding or one test that um, is gonna be pathognomonic or, or definitively uh, uh, used for this. So um, we do have classification schema. It's the Montreal classification for IBD. Um, and we define it in terms of clinical remission, mild, moderate, and severe. Now, I want to be clear for the students and the junior trainees as they're rotating through colorectal, you don't need to try and sound smart by telling me a patient has S2 level ulcerative colitis, right? Like, it's not like the patient has, you know, T2, N0, right colon cancer. It's not like that. However, we do use these as markers of how patients are presenting um, and how they're responding to treatment therapy. And they're also very useful for comparative studies as well. But if you wanna have a general gestalt, we have four or fewer stools a day that's considered mild UC. This is a lot of the people that never seek treatment. If you have more than four, but without any signs of systemic toxicity, that's moderate. These are the people that call their doctor and get some sort of treatment. And then severe is people that are hospitalized, get IV therapy and ultimately would potentially require surgery, okay? The other thing that you need to understand is there are different anatomic distributions of disease. Um, ulcerative colitis almost exclusively begins in the rectum and migrates proximally. So patients with E1 disease have ulcerative proctitis, right? So, and then it migrates into the colon. And then you get left-sided disease and then extensive because it is working basically from the anal pit and the proctodium back proximally to the midgut. Okay. How does it manifest clinically? So patients are gonna have hematochesia with increased frequency of bowel movements, tenesmus, and believe it or not, constipation, even though you're going to the bathroom a lot, okay? So remember, this is where you make a kind of a crowbar separation between constipation and obstipation. Constipation is I have to push real hard, but the stool comes out. Obstipation is I haven't been in three days, right? So as you're, under, as you're taking your clinical documentation, make sure you're documenting appropriately, right? Tenesmus is that sensation that uh, people will report where they have a fullness uh, in their bottom that never goes away no matter how much they poop, okay? Um, because it starts in the rectum, these are often the presenting symptoms and it, pro and it progresses to include more proximal disease with abdominal pain, cramping, and diarrhea sticks around. And then 
the amount of the symptomatic bowel movements with the bleeding and the pain gets progressively worse. Um, as it begins to move around into the right colon, depending upon how competent your ileocecal valve is, you can also develop what's called backwash ileitis, um, where the contents will flow backward through the ileocecal valve into the uh, terminal ileum, and those contents are often very caustic. Um, and the nature of the terminal ileum is such that um, it will get inflamed, and it can be very clinically confusing for folks because ileitis is one of the common presenting things in Crohn's disease. And so you have to, again, have your head about you. In patients that have severe disease, they can even have what we would call an autolytic colon. I've never found that term um, except in a few texts or whatever, but uh, Dr. Galandiak used to use that term um, frequently in the ORs as we were doing education, and I've always found it very interesting. Um, and this basically is where someone has such progressive disease that they need um, urgent treatment, likely surgery, um, but an autolytic colon uh, she told me one time famously she went to take a colon out and the thing just literally lysed in her hands because it was so diseased. So your differential diagnosis, of course, includes Crohn's, uh, indeterminate colitis, where we can't tell the difference, C. diff. Um, and because these are uh, hemorrhagic patients presenting with blood, you need to think about EHEC and all the old uh, standby infectious uh, diarrheas that can cause bleeding. Um, we do often uh, send stool cultures on these patients, um, but you need to also be on the lookout because uh, you can have weird omas that present with this disease, things like amoebiasis, collagenous colitis, all sorts of strange stuff because uh, the differential diagnosis of someone with refractory diarrhea and bleeding is fairly broad, okay? On gross pathology, what you have a, the, the finding you wanna look for is a crypt abscess, okay? This is the thing, this is for you guys in the middle here, how they try to trick you on the NBME shelf exam. They're not gonna give you guys an easy question like crypt abscess, they're gonna like hide up behind some stuff, okay? Um, they might talk on, on the surgery exam about the loss of goblet cells at the base of the crypts or the lack of transmural thickening, okay? And then they'll talk about the absence of skip lesions. It's basically continuous all the way throughout the colon. But the most important thing is a pathologist you trust, okay? Because this, the findings that you see under the microscope um, can be tricky and you have to have someone that really knows what they're doing. And um, having someone that has a uh, specialized um, in reading slides for patients with IBD uh, could be exceptionally helpful. And we're lucky enough that we have an established relationship um, even with some folks outside of uh, this institution uh, who've been helpful uh, for us in these instances in the past. So um, the difference between normal colon and UC is the fact that these uh, cribs will become distorted and shortened. You get the absences, you get the lock, uh, lack of the goblet cells, okay? So there's less mucin being produced in the mucosa, okay? So they may give you a microscopic slide on either one of these exams. So you need to be able to recognize the fact that here's a granuloma and here's a crypt abscess. And the way you can tell the difference is that crypt abscess will have this really nice and well-defined pink rind around it, right? Where it's been walled off from the surrounding area. Whereas the granuloma just looks, looks like this swirl of granulation tissue under the microscope, okay? So if they give you a, a slide on um, either the app site or the NBME shelf, look for that rind and it'll be able to tell you whether or not that's going to be UC. Okay. Another interesting finding that can happen as a result of this is pseudopolyposis. And you can see how the inflammatory cells have bunched up here at the root of the mucosa and basically eaten away at where uh, the mucosa would normally be. And so this looks like it's a polyp, but it's not. It's basically the normal lining of the colonic mucosa that appears polypoid under the microscope. And just there's these vast gaps in the lining of the mucosa where things should be normal. When you look at that endoscopically, it looks like this. And you look at this and you might think to yourself, oh my God, that's the worst case of adenomatous polyposis I've ever seen. This patient has dozens upon hundreds of polyps and we've got to you know, do a genetic workup on them. And while a genetic workup may be warranted, it's certainly not going to be looking for things like APC genes and whatnot. Rather, these are islands of normal colonic mucosa interspersed with areas that are just cut out and the lining of the colon is just missing, okay? 
So you're seeing exposed submucosa here. Okay. It can be very difficult to tell basic, based on endoscopic findings, whether or not you're looking at UC or Crohn's. Crohn's has the uh, well-known linear bear claw ulcers, but if you have giant islands of pseudopolyps and ulcerative colitis, um, then it can mirror those linear ulcers in Crohn's. And so um, when in doubt, biopsy, when you're not in doubt, biopsy, and then biopsy again, okay? These are some late stage endoscopic findings. And basically what you see on the left is that the mucosa is almost like burned out. It's like completely friable, has all these little punctate areas, these petechiae, and these are areas where we took biopsies, you can see here, okay? Um, on the right, this is a, a similar patient, but even worse. Um, and what you see is this is progressing toward that autolytic colon that Dr. Laniac famously referenced. And then here's uh, kind of another patient. Here's an area where that pseudopolypoid formation is very well described and there's just giant chunks missing. And uh, it's very likely that all these people will be coming to a, an operating theater near you soon. Um, one of the places that people make um, the most, uh, or not mistakes, but um, one of the more difficult clinical findings to, to, to delineate and, and make a diagnosis is between UC and Crohn's, of course. So um, they will try to trip you up on your exam between the diagnosis of these. And so you need to remember for UC, it's continuous, has rectal involvement, and there's very rarely, if ever, any sort of anal in involvement in this. So if a patient describes any sort of anal pain or anal disease like tags, fissures, fistulas, all that stuff, it's Crohn's almost every time, okay? If they have any sort of upper GI symptoms, and then if they describe granulomas, obviously there's no granulomas in UC, okay? So if you see any of those things, um, those are your triggers in the question stem to start thinking about Crohn's. Okay, laboratory findings, obviously you're gonna get basic labs on these folks. You know, you're gonna have significantly altered CBC and CMP. This is one of the few times in surgeries where I'm gonna ask you to get an ESR and a CRP um, because these are, you know, if you're on the trauma service, everybody comes in is gonna have an elevated ESR and CRP. But um, in the colorectal world, these can be terribly helpful, right? They're gonna be elevated. We know they're gonna be elevated. And unlike any number of, you know, potential tumor markers or other things, the degree to which they're implemented I'm, or they're elevated showing inflammation, I'm not terribly concerned with. What I wanna do is follow this over time. I wanna see it defervesce as we go through treatment, okay? You're probably gonna end up checking a C. diff if they're in the hospital, right? You may or may not think about sending O in parasites. I've never found that helpful, but everybody does it every time anyway. But the thing that's new is fecal calprotectin, okay? And this is a very expensive, but at the same time, very useful test because you can follow fecal calprotectin levels in the same way that you can follow inflammatory markers, but obviously it's gonna be much more specific for inflammation of the intestine and the gut, right? Whereas if you, you know, bump your knee trying to get coffee this morning, your ESR and your CRP are gonna help it. One other thing that's of use is um, something called a Prometheus panel. Um, and this is one of a number of commercially available products where we can do um, a series of antibody tests looking for mutations that when taken in aggregate can be helpful in determining if someone has ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, uh, or uh, neither. So you can order a Prometheus panel. And then when you get back, as you get back this graph, and this is what you used to get back was this, you know, kind of area under the curve with all the different tests. Now what you get back is um, uh, basically at the top, it just has a little box that says Crohn's or you see like they don't expect you to turn your cortex on at any point and understand what's going on here. They just give you like a thumbs up or thumbs down like the Roman emperor saying, yep, they've got it or no. Um, and that really bothers me because as someone who um, is interested in understanding why this works, what they're really trying to tell you is the positive predictive value of their test. And really what that means is that they this is how they re, um, report their PPV, but that's not the actual definition of it. This is what the mathematical definition of positive predictive value is. So how useful is this and why are we getting this, even though they're not reporting a true positive predictive value? Um, it's very expensive. 
And it's because if you've ever had a single patient who had Crohn's disease in their pouch um, and has to deal with that for the rest of their life, and you get to deal with that for the rest of your life, um, then you would understand why trying to make this diagnosis prior to going into surgery would be so critical. Um, so a restorative proctocolectomy is a wonderful thing for patients that can tolerate it, but for patients with Crohn's disease that have symptomatic Crohn's in the pouch and or anal symptoms, um, it can be um, potentially life-threatening if you've made a mistake. Radiologic studies, um, don't do barium, please get a gastrograph and enema. CT enterography and enterocolysis can be helpful, although they're much less helpful in UC than they would be in someone with Crohn's. You can get an MR enterography, although I don't think it's necessary. Um, you want to look for warning signs, okay? So things to keep in the back of your mind, extracolonic manifestations, cyclical episodes, and psychiatric history. A lot of these things are much more associated with Crohn's than they are with UC, okay? So this is what um, a traditional contrast enema would look like in someone with fairly fulminant disease. It has this moth-eaten pattern. You can't see the outline of the bowel wall nearly as well. And you can see how this is working proximally from the distal colon up toward the right side. And, you know, ultimately we'll get over here. On CT, you'll see um, mural thickening. And you'll see how there's almost this kind of ratty appearance where, you know, the epiploque are all angry. Um, and interestingly enough, only, a, you know, we like, to, we like to test on these ultracolonic manifestations of ulcerative colitis, but only about 6% of patients are going to have these. Um, if you want the mnemonic device for this, because I have to have mnemonic devices, I can't remember anything. So my mnemonic device for this is the jaundice pirate, right? So uh, uveitis, about 3% of patients are going to have uveitis, so pirates wear eye patches. Um, jaundice for 3% have sclerosis and cholangitis, right? And then about sacro, about 1% of patients will have ankylosing spondylitis, and so they'll be humped over with a crotch like, you know, um, all the people on Treasure Island used to be. So if you need a mnemonic device, there it is. Okay, let's make a difference between toxic megacolon and fulminant colitis. Toxic megacolon is basically when patients have significant distension on a plain film, but they don't have to have toxic megacolon to have fulminant colitis. Okay, and this is true for things like C. diff and Crohn's as well. But fulminant colitis is when you have more than six bloody VMs a day with at least one of the following, fever, tachycardia, anemia, and elevated fe fecal calprotectin or uh, previously elevated ESR or both. Okay, interesting definition is the way that this was originally defined back in the 50s um, was patients would have to fail medical treatment for five days before they could be diagnosed with fulminant colitis. Now I would say there's a number of our residents who've encountered patients with fulminant colitis when they have an arterial line consult in the middle of the night. Um, and so uh, I would say that this is not really necessary. You can diagnose someone with fulminant colitis right away. But uh, if you want to look area diet as you're uh, talking to Dr. Kavlik is in the middle of the night, make a difference between these two. Just because someone's colon is distended doesn't mean they're toxic. And just because someone's colon is not distended doesn't mean they don't need an emergent surgery. Okay. Interestingly enough, the rate of fulminant colitis has really skyrocketed in the past 10 years. And that has resulted in a trend towards stage surgery. Okay. So people are trying longer and longer to hold on to colons that they might not have otherwise. And what that means is that people are showing up with a more advanced disease. So previously, we would see patients much earlier in their course we talk about elective surgery, but a significant number of ulcerative colitis patients now present with fulminant active disease. They require urgent subtotal colectomy with an ileostomy um, and burying of the rectal stump and the fascia if you can um, with a three-stage approach where you do the colectomy, take them back later, take the, the rectum out, create the ileal reservoir, give them a distal loop J genostomy and then close it. All right, how do we manage it? So previously, this is how we managed it um, medically. We would just, you know, pick the most expensive, most horrible side effect thing we could, start there and work our way down. Um, I think that previously um, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and into the 80s, before we uh, began with a number of these treatments, the, the medical management of this was a lot more thoughtful. And this is a, a slide from um, when I gave 
um, a similar discussion as a colorectal resident here. Um, and I would say that this doesn't really apply anymore because we've advanced so much in the past three to five years in terms of the way that we treat these patients. So our goal is to induce remission. You want to get resolution of diarrhea and make their symptoms go away. But you also want to induce endoscopic remission because you want their mucosa to normalize with an intact vascular pattern and the ulcerations to go away. And then ideally, you would see the resolution of neutrophils on biopsy. And why is this part of it so terribly important? Because if you don't see the resolution of the neutrophils, the restoration of the mucosa, and something that just phenotypically appears normal, even though the patients may not have symptoms without a normal microscopic and macroscopic phenotype, patients are going to be at risk for malignancy long term. And so because the majority of patients don't have um, significant symptoms, it's really important for those of us that maybe are not going into a surgical career, you people in the middle here, that if you have a patient with ulcerative colitis, that you counsel them that if they are undergoing symptoms and they're not getting frequent endoscopic surveillance with, bi with biopsies, they're potentially putting themselves at life-threatening risk, not from fulminant colitis, but from ultimately you know, inflammatory related uh, malignancy, okay? So if you just have proctitis, these people that start proximally and um, are symptomatic from that, something as simple as a topical ASA derivative like misalamine can be very useful. Previously, this was ungodly expensive, but thanks to um, Mark Cuban and Cost Plus Drugs, we can now get this for about $8 a month, okay? This used to be $800 to $1,200 a month. Um, they rarely need systemic steroids, which was the mainstay of treatment previously. And most of these people, again, that was the kind of middle group of our folks on the classification schema, will get better in about two to three weeks. They can take up to six weeks. And about 80% of people with kind of low-grade symptoms will respond to this and won't need any sort of additional therapy. When the disease begins to propagate proximally, um, it's really kind of beyond the reach of that topical therapy. And so you want to progress to other things like sulfasalazine, um, acicol, pentassa, these formulations that lack the complications of other sulfa drugs because they act only locally uh, within the gut. Um, and so that can alleviate most symptoms, but for people that are unresponsive, you're going to require oral steroids in, a, in an attempt to um, get that inflammation at bay. But between these two things, a big chunk of people will get better in that middle column if they didn't respond and they had propagation of their disease somewhere uh, in the rest of the hindgut. This is kind of the, the topic that starts to confuse people a little bit when we start to talk about UC. Um, and that is what we call quote unquote biologic therapy. And this is based on the idea that that macrophage mediated inflammation um, is really the culprit uh, that causes the disease. And so we're going to attempt to block these receptors through recombinant antibodies. And it can be very, very effective. And it's really been the thing that kind of caused my, you know, A-bomb slide at the you know, beginning of this section because it has a significant number of side effects, including significant malignancy potential, significant immune system suppression, um, and your patients can't have anything that's related to cell-mediated immunity. They can't have a history of tuberculosis or even a positive PPD. We largely have abandoned this in our office in favor of a serum quantiferon to make sure because PPDs are notoriously um, difficult to get people to come back and have read. Um, you have to check things like hepatitis, HIV, and whatnot. And there is a risk of leukemia, lymphoma, but we've also had patients develop other malignancies as well. Um, my very first patient I ever operated on as an attending physician ultimately developed thyroid cancer as a result of you know, multi-decades long use of Humira, okay? So previously we would start at the top down, uh, sorry, we started the bottom up instead of working top down with ASA derivatives going up into steroids. Anti-metabolites are, are pretty rare to be used these days. Um, and so uh, you need to know that they exist. So methotrexate as the thiophrine 6 mp okay? Purine analog antimetabolites. Um, those probably are not going to be tested, but you can say at least you've seen them once. Um, and if you're going to put anybody on these drugs, you have to have um, a contract with them if they're a uh, female childbearing age, because these are horrible teratogens, okay? Um, right now, we're kind of in the golden age of biologics. Most of these are delivered either as subcutaneous injections or infusions. 
they all have really crazy names from a generic standpoint. They end in Mab or Mib or something like that. Um, and then they have really cute kind of fun, you know, Simsia, Ty Sabri, and too, like they all have these, um, you know, I want to get a job naming drugs so I can just come up with weird names for stuff. Um, but the thing, there's some things that have changed with this within the past kind of three to five years. We'll get to in just a second. The goal is really kind of to work here because the belief at the, you know, it was that if you start here up on the cascade with TNF alpha and then propagate distantly, you're handling kind of all of this all at once. But the problem is by doing that, you're also buying all the side effects and the problems as well. So that's old news. So we don't do this anymore. Um, let me skip that in terms of time. So the monoclonal antibodies against TNF, they're infusional uh, or remicate, remicate is infusional and it, um, you have to be very careful if anyone has any ongoing active infection. And multiple trials say it's better than placebo. Okay. Then we moved on from TNF alpha blockade to something like Intivio, which is where we don't actually block TNF alpha. We come down here and we're working on integrins. We're working on the actual effects inside the cell. Okay. Rather than working on how intestinal inflammation and this kind of you know gut barrier works. We're actually working much further down the cascade. And in the past 18 to 24 months, we've had a number of randomized trials that have been published in inflammatory bowel disease that have shown significant promise. And this is like kind of hot off the press new stuff, the command trial, others that have shown promise. And the drugs that are referenced in all these trials are all the ones that you see advertised usually around um, news um, or sometimes they'll have ads on football. So like uh, Rid Folk or Sky Rizzy um, or all these other sort of new fun names. Like they've even gotten better at naming the drugs in addition to developing them. Um, and so but these things are, are, are big, big money. And this is something that people don't think about in terms of treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, AbbVie, the company that makes a significant number of these drugs is second overall in terms of pharma revenue every year. It's not a drug maker we always think of when we think of kind of the traditional groups of folks. So they're second only to, um, who's in front? It's not J&J, &J, actually, I think it's J&J, &J, but like GlaxoSmithKline and, and Moderna and Pfizer and all these stuff, like they're way down the list behind Abby. So their biggest drug is Humira. So their biggest drug is $21 billion a year, okay? That drug alone is enough to put them ahead of like the bottom, you know, uh, on the group of 10, numbers 10 through six don't even approach this in terms of pharma sales every year. It's just one drug, okay? So now that we have these treatments with Skyrizi or Invoke that have about a 50% response rate for people that have failed every other form of treatment, it's gonna cost big bucks to have IBD. How big? This big. If you have Crohn's, it costs about $622,000 a lifetime for just for medical treatment, okay? If you have ulcerative colitis, it costs about $370,000 a lifetime for medical treatment. What's okay. different? I can take this out. I can't ever cut all the Crohn's disease out, okay? How do we do that, okay? So for people that are refractory to medical therapy, the fulminant colitis, they've got bleeding, that oncologic risk, okay? An abscess or perforation, you gotta worry about Crohn's disease, but any of these are good indications for surgery, okay? We wanna remove the entirety of the colothelium because the colothelium is the thing that's causing these people to have disease. Okay, so you're gonna do a total proctocolectomy plus something, okay? So total proctocolectomy plus an endileostomy where we just take and give them an end, a reservoir of some kind. You can do a straight ilioanal where you hook the ilium straight up to the anus or a continent ileostomy, or you can do a subtotal or total abdominal with an endileostomy and an ileorectal anastomosis. Don't do this, don't ever answer this. People have done it and tried to treat topically with that diseased rectum. It's a horrible idea. Okay. So total proctocolectomy with end ileostomy. This is good for patients that have profound proctitis and really have little chance of continence. Okay. Um, people that have a distal malignancy, secondary and inflammatory bowel disease, and they can't tolerate or manage the complications that might come with a pouch. So recurrent pouchitis. Um, intermittent flares of disease, 
um, frequency of bowel movements. So, I mean, thinking about doing a restorative colectomy on someone, you have to think about, can they make it to the bathroom, right? If they got to go to the bathroom six, seven times a day, what if they have difficulties with mobility, right? Maybe they're uh, a diabetic who has neuropathy and, you know, they've got problems with their feet, okay? You can do what's called an ileal reservoir, okay? So you can do what's called a J pouch, an S pouch, a W pouch, um, and the, you know, independent of what you call it, the ultimate function and goal of this is the same. It's to restore intestinal continuity while providing a reservoir for stool. The size of the reservoir, interestingly enough, really doesn't seem to matter. So this W thing might be better, you think, because it's like this big, enormous, bulky thing versus a J pouch. Um, I challenge you to get this down into a male pelvis and have it go well. I don't think that's going to work. Okay. You need to have intact sphincters and they have to have a ton of preoperative counseling to make this work, knowing that about 25% of patients with inflammatory bowel disease are going to have some sort of complication from that pouch lifetime. Um, and if you've made a, a oopsie in your diagnosis, then their pouch loss uh, rate is going to be about a third if you've had a real problem. The most ideal outcome is about two to four loose bowel movements a day. It can be a real huge number um, if they develop complications. And so we can have a lot of what we call micro movements. Um, the modern pouch is not equal to the classical one in that the, a lot of the complications that were present surgically don't exist anymore. And those were most common, commonly seen as uh, anastomotic strictures. Um, Common problems you can get in a pouch would be including things like pouchitis, where you get bacterial overgrowth of the small bowel uh, due to stasis. The small bowel was not designed to be a rectum, uh, contrary to popular belief. Um, one, of the, one of the best things I ever heard as a fellow was that there's no rectum like the one God gave you and we can't put another one back there. Okay, so if you do develop pouchitis, that could be patients will prevent with severe pain, clustering, micro movements, and they'll even have a lot of bleeding that felt like they've never had their surgery done. Um, the treatment for that is you want to give antibiotics to alter the composition, probiotics, and you can even give um, treatments to help opsonize the clinically relevant bacteria, but that's kind of in very severe and extreme cases. Okay, you can develop an anatom anatomic and anastomotic strictures um, at the area where you do the surgery. You can manage this with just simple dilation. Unfortunately, this is likely a blood supply problem, blood supply problem, where you're trying to get the pouch down in the pelvis, and without pouch excision, it's going to be a lifelong issue. If you've not resected the entirety of the colothelium where you got to put this back together, you can get what's called cupitis, where you have persistent ulcerative colitis at the staple line between the transected rectum and the anal canal, um, which can be helped out significantly by luminal treatment. But this is a uh, this is not a symptom that you should be having your patients experience if you're doing a thoughtful operation. And then the tenesmus and aplasticity uh, from the pouch often can be a side effect of all those things we just mentioned, but this can just happen anyway. Um, patients' reservoir will not dilate appropriately. A lot of times patients will come in with a pouch um, and you get a phone call from ED and say, they got a bowel obstruction, their bowels horribly dilated. Well, yeah, of course, their distal bowels dilated because of the luminal pressure that's been the stool burden, even though they have multiple bowel movements a day, has been progressively dilating their just a small bowel for years at a time. And so just because someone looks obstructed on an x-ray with a pouch, um, you need to be doubtful of that. Okay. You can do a straight ileal anal, which is almost exclusively reserved for young patients. You can do this if a reservoir won't reach because the mesentery is problematic. Okay. Um, you're going to need lots of constipating medication. And I would say that um, unless the patient is very, very young, I'm talking like single digits, you're probably setting that patient up for a lifetime of issues. Okay. You could do what's called a Coke pouch or a K pouch, where you uh, create this kind of nipple valve that occurs um, uh, where the bowel is intussuscepted upon itself and then sewn to the skin. The patients that can then intubate uh, and empty that pouch in a, in a fashion that's designed to be uh, continent. Um, it's really rarely performed outside a handful of centers. The lifetime complication rate is about 80% with a high degree of pouch failure. You got to have a very knowledgeable patient. Um, and then I remember making rounds on a patient once as a fellow um, where we were seeing a patient with a coat pouch that had been sick for about two weeks in the unit with something else. And no one had just like, oh, there's nothing coming from the ileostomy. Well, no one had intubated it. 
And I, I will spare you the graphic detail of, of Dr. Glanick intubating that pouch because uh, uh, she fixed that problem very quickly. All right, special considerations. Um, don't forget about the need for potential prophylactic colectomy, but I would say this is much more common in patients that have persistent active disease, micro and macroscopically. Watch out for B12 levels if you're going to do a pouch for people that have uh, have undergone multiple uh, terminal ileal resections or problems. Constipating medications are your friends. Before, I would say lamodium, imodal, uh, sorry, lamodal, imodium, codeine, and the paragoric, but um, the reason I conflated those two just now is I've moved imodium to the front because in her infinite wisdom, Dr. Cavalucas reminds us that this is available over the counter and this is not, and this keeps her from being woken up in the middle of the night where this one does. Um, there's a little spur in the pouch that you have to divide with the stapler as you create it. Um, and you can't forget to divide that or you may have anastomotic problems. And then one of the things I would say that is vastly underappreciated in terms of this surgery is trying to reperitonealize the mesentery of the small bowels you put it in the pelvis. Um, at least once every one to two years, I have to take someone back for a bowel obstruction where they've developed an internal hernia because their surgeon did not have the bowel reperitonealized. And so the mid-jejunum has slipped underneath the pouch and is trapped between their pouch and the pelvis. Um, we have a series of total robotic pouches we've done here. And so what we do is we, and we've got one of these coming up in about nine or 10 days, I think. Um, this is one of our, our chief residents, Dr. Mash. She was in the operating room uh, with me um, when we did one of these not too long ago. And she did a fair amount of the case and did it very well. And uh, this is her, um, uh, just, we make a little tiny incision here at the bottom. We've done all the work robotically. And so she gets up there and she starts um, you know, doing some snake charmer type of thing and, you know, eviscerating this um, divided colon uh, that she's been working on for several hours uh, in terms of trying to get it out of there. So uh, um, one of the questions I get when we're interviewing students for potential residencies, and it seems like maybe y'all have been instructed on what questions to ask, is they say, what am I most proud of as a surgical faculty member here at U of L? Um, and this was the beginning of the academic year um, with Janice, our nurse practitioner, some of our awesome studs, and then our lineup of residents. And this is what I'm proud of, right? See, they're smiling. They're all happy. They love being, they love being on colorectal because it's an amazing experience. And they love working with our, uh, all jokes aside, what am I proudest of? The fact that our trainees do an amazing job. And I really love working here. And uh, we look forward to interviews this morning. So with that, I'll take any questions. All right, Farmer, we don't have much time. I have a, a quick question. We didn't talk much about the risk of uh, colon cancer and also ulcerative colitis, what proper surveillance should be, and whether or not any of these uh, therapies, uh, if effective, will potentially reduce the risk of cancer. Uh, and finally, uh, perhaps you could give us a, a shameless, uh, more shameless self promotion of our program. And, and why the residents uh, and applicants who, uh, who are with us today might see a, a, a fair number of these kind of cases and what they might expect to do as a resident. Yes, sir. So in terms of colon cancer, um, you know, we have seen a significant decrease in the number of patients presenting with kind of um, similar stage uh, disease than we would previously. And what I mean by that is, is we, we pound for pound, we have fewer people showing up with advanced cancer and ulcerative colitis because they get much more intensive endoscopic surveillance. And so um, the, the thing that we worry about, and I did not touch on in this topic because it's much more appropriate for uh, a colorectal fellowship lecture, is the concept of uh, associated um, uh, mucosal lesions that are things like DOMS. And uh, there's, there's a lot of pathology and, and kind of nuance that goes into understanding uh, the difference between inflammation and cancer and, and kind of micro foci of cancer in patients with UC. Um, but that's one of the reasons that starting, uh, once a patient has a diagnosis of UC, they really, I, my opinion, they should at least get a scope every year looking for um, uh, pathology. Um, there's no hard and fast reason behind that opinion other than I have high index of clinical suspicion for problems. Um, and there's not really a good, uh, you know, necessary recommendation behind that from 
a surgical standpoint, other than I want to catch these people uh, early. We do recommend a prophylactic colectomy for cancer at about seven to eight years for people with active disease. Um, but that really is that kind of bottom third quadrant of folks. Um, the other thing is that pound for pound, um, our patients with um, inflammatory bowel disease associated cancer um, seem to somehow do a little bit better in terms of uh, oncologic outcomes. In terms of, you know, what you can expect if you were to do training here and seeing patients like this, I think this is the mere tip of the iceberg. I think this is um, a training program that you can be proud of. I think this is a place where surgical training is going to be the best in the country. I think you're going to get um, exposure to um, just as many fun and interesting and thought-provoking elective cases as you will um, challenging uh, sick patients. Um, and I think that, you know, the reason that I chose to stay uh, when people ask me is the medicine's good here, the surgery's excellent here, but the reason I chose to stay was because of the people here and the people are what make the institution. And so you can train in surgery a lot of places in the country, but you can't train with these people in a lot of places in the country. There's only one place. So keep that in mind as you make your rank list. Uh, we're out of time, but Dr. Glandiak, final comment or question? No, it was a wonderful overview, and I just would love your comment that in my practice, I'm seeing more and more patients who have never seen a surgeon yet have been taken through the gamut of medical treatment so they have gone through everything, almost similar to cancer patients who have been put to optimal therapy radiation before they got to the surgeon for comment. Uh, the, well, the, what they've done with these newer drugs is they now um, describe our surgery the same way you would describe mortality in cancer. It is now, um, they put in Kaplan-Meier curves and talk about colectomy-free survival. So there's, I think that speaks to what you're talking about. All right. Thank you, Dr. Farm, for outstanding great round. We we'll move on with our activities for our applicants. Thank <laughs> you.